Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to begin to minister this morning on the subject of faith. Praise the Lord. You know, there are five elements to faith that I need you to get down. First of all, element number one is hearing. Then number two, receiving. Three is believing. Four is speaking. And five is acting. Praise God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 10 and let's begin studying the word of God on the subject. The apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome and he says in verse eight, but what saith it, the word is nigh or near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach that if thou shalt confess, which means to acknowledge with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There's a couple of words there that you see repeatedly. Heart and mouth, praise the Lord. Now, of course, what do we mean by faith, praise the Lord? Well, the New Testament is translated from uh, the Greek, and the Greek word for faith is the word pistis. Pistis is defined as persuasion, is defined as conviction, and is also defined as assurance, praise the Lord. So when we're talking about faith in this teaching and in this context, we're not talking about some uh, organization that you may belong to. When we say or talk about faith, we're not referring to whether or not you're Baptist or Methodist or uh, Episcopal or some other uh, earthly organization. We're referring to, praise God, what's in you, your persuasion, your conviction, your assurance, praise the Lord. Now, we want to talk about why, three reasons why faith is very important. And let's begin. Turn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and we're going to read from God's word in the sixth verse. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says, but without faith, remember, faith means being persuaded. It's your conviction. It's your assurance. Praise the Lord. And the Bible references this about God and about his written word. You can't separate God from his word. His word is God and God is the word. They are one. Praise the Lord. Heaven and earth shall pass away, it says. And God says, my word shall not pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle, not one little part. Praise God. You can't separate the two. So notice what it says here in verse six. But without faith, it is not possible, impossible to please God. You know, this word please in the Greek also means to gratify God entirely. God is not gratified, praise the Lord. He's not pleased with our faith. Note what it continues to say. For he that approaches God or comes to, comes to God must. There is no equivocation about this. In other words, this is the way this must be done. He that comes to God must believe that he is. He is what? He is everything he said he is. And he said he is your mother, he's your father, he's your sister, he's your brother. Praise God, he's your provider, he's your healer, he's your banker, he's your protector. Whatever it is you need in your life, he is God Almighty. He is all powerful, praise the Lord. And yes, he is involved in all that. Well, first, he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So those who come after God, praise the Lord, will have rewards that not only they will see, but other men will see, praise God. So first of all, Reason number one, why faith is extremely impossible, because you can't please God without it. God is only gratified when you walk in faith toward him as opposed to doubting him. He is our heavenly father. And of course, we understand those of us who are parents. I have three kids and uh, at, the, at the time of this ministry, I have, I have seven grandkids, praise the Lord. And trust me, I, I, I am pleased 
When if I tell them something, they don't have any doubt about it. That's good enough for them. Papa said it, praise God, and that's it. Well, that's the way our Heavenly Father is too. Here's the second reason why uh, faith is important. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. And let's read what the apostle of love, John, had to say about this subject of faith. Praise God. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 says, For whatsoever, that means everyone, everyone who is born of God overcometh the world. Now the, world, the word overcometh means he conquers the world. Amen. And he goes on to say, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. The word victory means it is our means of success that we conquer the world. Then notice the rest of this verse, even our pistis, even our confidence, our assurance, our conviction, our persuasion causes us, regardless to who you are, where you live, where you come from, praise God. If you have faith in God and faith in his word, praise the Lord, then it says you can overcome anything you are dealing with in the world system. Now turn to Romans chapter one because I made a statement of, uh, a few moments ago is that there's no difference between God and his word. And if you've got God's word, you got God, you got God, you got God's word. I mean, they are inseparable, praise the Lord. And why is the word so important? Well, Romans chapter one, verse 16 reads thusly. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel or good news, praise God, or good report of the anointed one and his anointing. For it is the power of God. Now, the word here, power, is the Greek word dunamis. Miraculous power. Miraculous ability. Amen. The gospel, the good news about Jesus and the word, is the power of God unto salvation. Soteria. That word salvation means it is for rescue and safety and for deliverance and help. Praise God. And so there is supernatural ability that is in the word of God and it says here to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So it doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what your lineage is, doesn't matter what your skin color is, praise God. The word of God has supernatural ability in it, praise God, to cause you to be rescued and cause you to be safe and cause you to be delivered and cause you to be healed. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so when, when he says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, in just a moment, we'll find out how you get that faith. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, one more talking about three reasons why this particular subject is important. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to read verse 38. Oh, hallelujah. Hebrews 10, 38 says, now the just, and the word just means those who are innocent, those who have been declared righteous. When did that happen to you? If you are born again, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, referring to Jesus, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made. I like that word made because it means to be manufactured. The righteousness of God in him. Something supernaturally happened to you when you got born again. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Something happened. Praise the Lord. That is, you heard that word regarding Jesus, and you applied faith to it. Like we started out in Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10. Praise the Lord. Guess what happened? Power was released, recreated you, took the old man, praise the Lord, and now created a new man and made that man in the eyes of God righteous in right standing with him today. Praise the Lord. You are not an old sinner saved by grace. You were no sinner. And it was by the grace of God that now you are saved, you are healed, you are delivered, you are set free. Praise the Lord. Now note what this verse continues to say. Now the just, those who have been declared righteous, shall live. And this word live means a, over a lifetime, shall live by pistis. 
They live by their persuasion and their conviction and their assurance about God and his word. And it says here, but if any man draws back, that draws back from living by faith, God says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That kind of agrees with that Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's not possible to please God. God derives pleasure, amen, when you uh, operate in faith towards him. Faith, praise God, walking by faith, is not intended to be a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not supposed to be just an emergency measure that all of a sudden you run to when things go wrong. No, praise the Lord. There is the life of faith. And the life of faith is something you do day in, day out, praise God, year in, year out. This is just how we roll, we would say, praise God. This is just what we do. This is just how we do it. We live this way in the name of Jesus. Now, praise God. Let's talk about the fact how faith is, is acquired. How do you get it? Well, turn to Romans chapter 10. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And let's go just a little bit further with this. Romans 10, 17 reads as follows. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Praise the Lord. So that pistis, that, that persuasion, that assurance, that confidence comes by, number one, consistently hearing, constant, repetitive hearing. But see, not just faith in God comes that way. Faith in everything comes that way. Whatever you consistently hear repetitively. If you hear something in the news media that says the same thing again and again and again and again, you will come to the place where eventually uh, you will have faith in that. You will believe that. You will order your life by that. When you went to school, it was the same thing. There's certain things they told you again and again and again in school. And over time, because you heard it repetitively, you came to the place that that's what you ordered your life by. That's what you believe, praise God. Well, faith in God's word comes by constantly hearing it again and again and again, praise the Lord. Now that's very important because as we already said in Romans 1.16, that word you hear is the power of God to all salvation, your rescue, your safety, your deliverance, or your health. Now there are two ways to put yourself in position to constantly hear the word. Well, Romans chapter 10, we'll go back there, praise the Lord. That first way is consistently having preaching and teaching or singing of the word. And when I say singing of the word, I don't mean singing about the word. I'm talking about singing the scripture, actually, just taking the scripture and just putting it to psalm, praise the Lord. Well, now glory to God. Of these two ways, way number one is Romans 10, 14. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so number one is through preaching, hearing preaching of the word repetitively, teaching of the word repetitively, singing of the word itself repetitively, praise God. And so that's first of all, putting yourself in position to always be filled with faith. This is why coming to church is important. The scripture told us the closer we get to the end of uh, things, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, that we are to assemble more and more. You need more and more word the closer we get because things are going to become negative in some ways, praise the Lord, the Bible tells us. But when we walk in faith and we live by faith, praise God, it's not going to affect us. Uh, here's the second way. Let's turn to Joshua, amen, chapter 1. Hallelujah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 8. Let's set the stage for Joshua 1, 8. Joshua is in a very difficult situation. How would you like to come behind Moses? The people are used to Moses. They're used to, uh, you know, someone that uh, causes them to be delivered from Egyptian bondage, someone that plagues come, someone that God follows them around as a cloud and, and a pillar of fire. Uh, I mean, someone that's great, supernatural. And now Moses is gone. 
And now you have two or three million people all looking to Joshua to see now what are you going to do now that Moses is gone. And Joshua is full of fear. I know that because of what he says to Joshua, praise the Lord. And let's read in Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 8 in just a moment. But we're kind of setting the stage for it. God says to Joshua in verse 6, he said, Be strong now and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land that I swear unto the fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which is, of course, at that time was the word of God, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever thou goest. Praise God. So now he's going to tell him, and again in verse 9, be strong and of good courage. Why do you have to tell someone three times in just a few verses, be strong, only be strong and of good courage, because you are full of fear. I mean, you are greatly concerned. Can I do this job? I mean, uh, how can I follow Moses? How can I walk in these major shoes? And then God begins to answer him. He said, through the word of God, and then notice verse 8. This book of the law, or the word, shall not depart out of thy mouth. And I'd underline that word, mouth. But thou shalt meditate. Now the word meditate, praise the Lord, in the Old Testament means this. It means to murmur. It means to mutter. It means to speak. It means to talk. It means to utter this. It means to imagine. So what he said Thou shalt speak, now you shall talk, you should imagine, praise God, uh, uh, therein that word day and night. Note how often. You got a huge job in front of you, and this job is massive. And so you just can't, you just can't do this just in the morning. You need to do this day, you need to do it afternoon, you need to do it early evening, you need to do it at night, you need to do it if you are awake because you are going to need faith power to, to, to carry out this massive uh, authority and assignment that I've given you. So he said, meditate therein day and night. Why? Here's the benefits. That thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. Revelation is going to come when you do that. And then when you get revelation, when you get understanding, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Now notice he says, you make your way prosperous. God didn't say, I will make you prosperous. He said, you will make your way prosperous. And, praise God, and then you shall have good success. Now the word prosper here in the Hebrew also means to push forward. It means to break out. You see, they, they have uh, been in the wilderness for 40 years. They now got to break out. They got to cross the Jordan River. They got to go into the promised land. So he said, now, if you do this, if you will meditate the word day and night, if you will say it with your mouth. If you will mutter it, praise the Lord. And then you will imagine it coming to pass. He said, you will break out. You will have good success. The term good success means that you will be intelligent in what you do. You will be instructed in what you do. You will have understanding in what you do. You will have wisdom and you will have guidance from me, said the Lord. Glory to God. And so the second way in which you put yourself in constant position is to be meditating on the word. Take that word out. Speak it. Praise God. Take that word. Meditate it. Talk about it. Praise God to yourself over and over and over and over and over again. See, the Bible was not intended to be read silently. The Bible, God's word, was intended to be read aloud, especially aloud to yourself. Praise the Lord. Then, then also notice what the psalmist said about meditation of the word. Psalm, uh, let's take a look at uh, number one, the number one psalm, first psalm. Psalm number one, and let's read verse one. Bless, glory to God. That means that person is happy, that person is to be envied, that person has good things happening unto them. Bless the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, their wisdom doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't stand with those who don't want to go with God. Doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful of those who say, I don't believe that word. But verse two, his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the word of God. And in his law or in his word, does he 
meditate again? Does, does he speak? Does he study? Does he talk? Praise God. Notice day and night, verse 3 tells you the result. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, have very deep roots. He will bring forth his fruit in his season or his time. He won't miss the window of opportunity that God brings his way. Hallelujah. And his leaf also shall not wither. He will not fade away. He will always stay strong. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. Glory to God. He'll have wisdom. He'll have understanding. It will work. Glory to God. And so when we talk about then faith, praise God. You put yourself in constant position when you do these two things, get preaching and teaching of the word and singing of the word, the word itself, when you meditate the word, particularly like he said to do it day and night. Now, I told you there were five elements to faith, praise God. Hearing, and that's what we've been talking about so far. The second one is to receive. Well, what do you mean by receive? Because you can hear the word and you can reject it. You don't necessarily have to receive it. So the word receive means to accept something as being legitimate. It means to be open and then, since it's legitimate, to further listening. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus gives a parable of the sower, sows the word. And of the many parables that Jesus does, he tells you that this one is the most important of all his parables. He says in verse 13, he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? A parable is a short story intending to illustrate a point. And how then will you know all parables? In other words, if you don't know this one, if you can't discern this one, then you won't have the keys to all the rest. What is the parable? Verse 14, the sower sows the word. It's about the word of God and placing the word of God into the ground of your human spirit. We've told you two ways how to do that. He goes on to say in verse 15, these are they by the side of the road. So he's going to use this example as seed that's intended as a farmer to plant into the ground that has great harvest. But he said this seed, instead of being planted into the ground and producing a harvest, is just thrown on the side of the road where the word is sown. But when they have heard the word, Satan comes instantly, takes away the word that was planted in their hearts. And it doesn't say how. It doesn't say that Satan used affliction or persecution or cares of this world or deceitfulness of riches or lust of other things, which he will about the other types of ground. But he said Satan just immediately walked in. Amen. Why was that? That's because the individual, when they heard the word, said, no, nah, no, nah, I don't accept it. And so there's nothing else for Satan to do. He just takes it and he walks away with it. This is by the side of the road. So the first one is to hear the word. Amen. Faith comes by hearing. Then to receive the word as being legitimate. You put yourself in position to do the next thing. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Praise God. So element number one was to hear. Element number two was to receive. Here's element number three. Let's read verse 23. And Jesus said unto them, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You know, the word believe actually means to commit to trust. So he said all things. And what does all mean? Everything. What's left after all? Nothing. All things can happen to them who commit, praise God, their trust. Praise God. All things are possible if you commit your trust to God and to what God has said. Praise the Lord. Amen. So believing is something you do of the heart. We started out with Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that thou shalt announce with thy mouth Jesus as Lord and shall believe, commit to trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. So believing is a decision. You make a decision to believe with your heart. You heard it, now you open, your, you open yourself to it, praise God, and now I decide I'm going to believe with all my heart what I have heard. I'm going to commit to trust. And then there's number four, praise the Lord. Mark 11, chapter, since we in Mark, there's hearing, receiving, believing, and then there's speaking. 
Mark 11 chapter, Jesus said in verse 23, a famous text. In fact, if you backed up to verse 22, Jesus answered and said unto them, have faith in God, have trust, have confidence, have belief, be assured in God. Verse 23, Jesus said, truly I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, he's talking about a little mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Praise the Lord. Well, this word here, speak or say, means to command, to call, hallelujah, to answer. And so there may be the mountains of your life, but if you have heard the word on it, you've decided to receive the word on it, Praise God. You decide to believe what God's word said about it. And now you make a decision to agree with God out of your mouth. You began to say, I command this to be so. God's word says this. This is who I am. This is what I say. Praise God. And that's the fourth element. And it will produce. And then finally, element number five. Turn to James chapter one. Glory to God. James chapter one. And element number five is act. So it's hearing, receiving, believing, speaking, acting. Praise God. Or we could say action. James 1.22 says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving your own self. Number five is to act. The word act means to do. The word act also means to move forward, praise God. That's verse 23 says, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. He sees himself, goes his ways, but forget what manner of man he was. And so you can have the other four, but that number five is where most people stumble. They may hear it, they might receive it, they might believe it, they might even talk it, but they won't act like it is really true. And that's what is required, hearing, receiving, believing, speaking, acting, the five elements of faith. Now, let me illustrate this. Turn to Mark chapter 5, and let's take a look at a woman in the fifth chapter of Mark who has all five of these things working in her behalf. Mark chapter 5, let's begin reading verse 25, and a certain woman. Anytime you see the word certain in scripture, then it's not talking here about a parable. This woman lived. There's a certain woman which had a, an issue of blood 12 years. She had a constant bleeding hemorrhage 12 years. She suffered many things of many doctors, and then she spent all the money that she had. So now is she not only sick, she's now broke. And then it says, but rather she got worse even after she went to the doctor's. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said. So first of all, faith came by hearing. Someone told her that Jesus was the Messiah and that he is in town. Now, there was a word that her life was based on, something she had been hearing uh, in the synagogue all her life when they came to the book of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 4, it told us about uh, what they believe when the Messiah would come. In verse 2, it says, But unto you that fear my name in Malachi 4, 2, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Now, when you see this word wings, don't think of like wings of a bird. The Hebrew word here for wings, kanaf, it means the edge of a garment or skirt. Amen. In other words, she had heard all her life that when the Messiah came, there would be healing in the border of his skirt, praise the Lord. And so when she heard of Jesus, someone told her, she heard the word, she then made a decision to receive what she heard is, yeah, amen. Now what she's gonna do? She's gonna believe and speak that. Because when she heard of Jesus, for she said, let's back to verse 27. She heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind. There's the action part and touched his garment for she said. In other words, she had been saying, and if you read the actual text, she had been repetitively saying, she had been, she was saying again and again and again, the moment I touch him, and she, that meant the border of his garment, the moment I touch him, I'll be whole. 
Praise God. The moment I touch him, I'll be whole. I know she said I'll be whole because of what Jesus is going to say. But she said, the moment I touch him, I'll be whole. She said it again and again. The more she said it, the more faith came. The more she said it, the more faith came. The more she said it, it moved her feet. The more she said it, praise God, she got up with her frail body. The more she said it, even though there was a tremendous crowd and, and there are people there who are desperate. And, and if you ever been around desperate people, you know that they jostle and they, and, and they fight and, and, and they push and do all kinds of things. But what she's going to do, she's going to fight her way, even though she is extraordinarily weak. Twelve years with a constant bleed. She isn't physically well. She's not physically strong. But now she's determined because she's been saying it. And saying it again. So notice what happens. Praise the Lord. She touched the hem of his clothes. Verse 35, verse 29. As soon as she did, straightway or immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue, and the word virtue here is dunamis, it means miraculous power, healing power, had gone out of him turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Uh, amen. Now, touching his clothes was not the only way in which people received healing from Jesus. But that's what this woman believed because that's what she heard, that's what she received, praise God. That's what she said. And it's what she's going to do. She's going to act on that. Praise the Lord. Notice the disciples in verse 31 said, you see the whole multitude touching you. What do you mean, who touched you? And Jesus looked round about to see her that had done this thing. Verse 33, but the woman, fearing and trembling, afraid, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth, told her her whole testimony. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith, your pistis, your trust, your, be your assurance, your being reliant upon me, have made you, and note the term, whole. Because not only was she physically sick, she's now broke. Jesus said what she said. Your faith has made you whole. Go in shalom. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Go, and be, go in peace and be hold of your plague. You see all five things in here. She heard. She received. She believed. She spoke. And then she acted. And it released the power of God. Now, Satan knows everything that I've been ministering unto you. And so in just these next few minutes, I want to share with you Satan's plan to try and stop you from living by faith, having the miracles of Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to him that believeth, praise the Lord. And Satan has a plan of attack, and you need to understand what that is. Jesus knew you need to know it. So let's go back to that Mark chapter 4 again. Glory to God. Because the word told us faith comes by hearing. It didn't say faith came by tests and trials. Faith don't come by tests and trials. Tests and trials is not for the purpose of building faith. Tests and trials are for the purpose that we're about to read of destroying faith. So notice what Jesus said once again. Let's go back to verse 13. Know ye not this parable? How then shall you know all parables? The sower sows the word. The subject of the parables, the word of God, and its ability to produce and Satan's attempt to stop its miracle working power. Let's keep on reading here. Praise the Lord. Verse 15. These are they by the wayside or side of the road where the word of God is planted. But when they heard that word, Satan came instantly, took away the word that was sown in their heart. Why? Because they heard it, but it, they did not receive it all over with. Verse 16. Here's another group of people. These are they in the same way which are sown or had the word of God sown and it fell on stony ground. It doesn't go, doesn't go good into the earth. The earth, praise God, he's referring to is the ground of your human heart. It's sown, praise God, by preaching and teaching or out of your own mouth or singing the word. Who, when they heard the word, they immediately receive it with gladness or with a shout. They begin to shout, oh, that word is good. But they had no root. They had no real depth in themselves. And so they only last for a while. That's what we're talking about, that Psalm chapter 1, the day and night meditation of the word. He became like a tree planted by the rivers of water, long roots. So they didn't have enough roots in them. And so they lasted for a little while. 
But afterward, when affliction, affliction is pressure brought against you through various circumstances that are negative. When affliction or persecution, which is also circumstances which are negative and which Satan uses people to deliver it to you. Arise if I know what he says here, for the word's sake. In other words, Satan came immediately because you got the word and hit them with affliction, hit them with persecution. Immediately they were offended. The word offended, scandalizo, means that then they were tempted to stumble, to trip, to fall away. So the purpose of the affliction and the purpose of the persecution was to cause you to back away from the word of God, to become offended. Why did God let this happen to me? And all that. Try tests and trials don't build faith. Test and trials for the purpose of destroying faith, Jesus said. Let's continue what he said in verse 18. These are they which are sown on thorns, so seed again. But instead of it going into the good ground, it winds up in the, in, in the thorny area. They also hear the word. Every one of them heard the word. Every one of them faith was available, praise God. But what they did with it really mattered. They also heard the word, verse 19. And the cares of this world, the word care, the, that word means the distraction. So if Satan could not stop you through affliction, if he couldn't stop you through persecution, then he tried to distract you, get your focus on something else. That could be, that could be race, it could be money, it could be who knows. It could be something as mundane as, as sports. Something that takes up all your time and takes up your focus. The distractions of this world, number one, Satan uses. The deceitfulness of riches. Didn't say riches. It's saying being deceived by them. See, the Bible said in, in 1 Timothy 6.10 that the love of money is the root of all evil. Didn't say money was the root. It said the love of it. You can commit that sin and not have a dime, not have a, a denarius, not, not have a ruble in your pocket. Uh, amen. Praise God. In other words, he's talking about a, someone who has made their focus trying to get a lot of money, thinking if I just got the money, everything would be all right. Well, if you live long enough like I have, you know that you can get the money and it makes everything, everything worse, you see. And so this individual has chosen to put their focus on that, less focus on the Word of God or no focus on the Word of God. And so they're not good ground. Finally, it says, and the lust of other things. The word lust means an inordinate strong desire for. I just got to have this. I just got to have that. Uh, amen. Anything that you uh, give more time to than you do the word of God and time with God can become something that is a lust, something that uh, your flesh desires to have. Praise the Lord. But then notice what he says in verse 20. These are they which are on good ground, fruitful ground, hallelujah, abundant ground. They hear the word, they receive that word, they act on the word or bring forth fruit, praise God, some 30, some 60, and 100 fold. Why 30, why 60, and why 100 fold? Because people act on this at different levels. Uh, amen. They hear, receive, believe, speak, and act. Some do it with all their might, all their focus. Some are day and night. Some just sometimes. Amen. In other words, whatever uh, position, to whatever extent you act on the word of God, these five elements will determine just how far you are. You can become a 30-fold Christian, praise the Lord. In other words, you have, well, one-third production. You can be 60-fold, almost two-third production of the capability of the word. Or you're going to have a hundred-fold production, praise God, and 10,000 percent production. It works all the way in your life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, then notice what else that Jesus said as we're starting to wrap this up in the last six minutes. Jesus said in verse 23 in the same Name, same parable. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, beware, take heed, pay attention. What you hear. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. See, it's not just faith, faith in God's word comes from hearing the word, but faith in other things comes by hearing. See, whatever you repetitively hear, if you keep hearing things that's always contrary to the word of God, that's what you're always hearing day in, day out. You will develop faith in it. 
and you will come to the place where you hear that, you receive that, you believe that, you speak that, and you will act, act that, and you'll be totally opposite God and everything God stands for, praise God. So he said, beware what you hear, and with what degree that you estimate what you hear, praise the Lord. Whatever degree that you do that, it'll be measured unto you. If you hear the word as being, praise God, God said it, I believe it, that settled it, and there's no more argument about it, glory to God, that's how you measure it, then that's the result you'll get. He said, so, so however you measure it, and unto you that here shall, be more be, shall more be given. That's the way it always is with God. Amen. Whatever you get or whatever you give God, you get back good measured, pressed down, shaken together, running over in all kinds of realms. And the more revelation of the word you get, revelation brings more revelation. Understanding gives you more understanding. Wisdom gives you more wisdom, praise God. All that will bring maturity to you. You'll grow up in God and your roots will get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, depending on, depending on how you choose to hear and the other things that he said. He goes on to say, for he that hath to him shall be given. And to him that have not shall be taken even that which he has. And that's what happened with the very first one. They heard the word, but they made no decision about it to receive it, and they lost it right away. Or you can make, this, make that decision when you hear the word, praise God, and that faith comes because it always comes. That's how you got born again. You heard the word about Jesus. You decided that this is plausible. You made a decision to believe what you heard about Jesus. Then you confess Jesus as the highest authority of all. He is Lord, and praise God, you're acting on it. And guess what happened? supernatural power was released. God's power recreated you and you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. And guess what's been happening unto you? As you hear more of the word, and as you walk more with God, you're getting more and more and more of the things of God. Finally, let me close what Jesus said here with verse 26. And he said, so is the kingdom of God, our sons. This is how it works. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. The seed, once again, is the word of God. And he should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring up, he knoweth not how. So he said, praise God, the seed is like with a farmer. You plant that seed in the ground, and the farmer, if he plants it on Monday, doesn't go to the ground on Tuesday and say, nothing happened, so it must not be any good, or that it must not work. No, he plants the seed in the ground, and he goes to bed, and he gets up, and he goes to bed, and he gets up, praise the Lord. Verse 27 said, he should sleep and rise night and day, and that seed should spring up, and he don't know how. Amen. Well, patience is required. See, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. The word patience, praise God, means cheerful endurance. You keep your joy even if you're going through the test and trials and Satan's trying to knock you out. But instead of uh, getting down about it, you decide to rejoice because you believe doesn't matter what's, what's happening now. I know what the end result will be. It will be the result of victory. My faith produces victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world. My faith. Hallelujah. Notice what he said. He said, you don't even have to know how. So you may not understand. How in the world is God going to get this done? That's not your business. Your business, praise God, is to believe him. It's his business to produce the miracle. Amen. You stop trying to produce it for yourself. Finally, he says here, verse 28, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. I call that the law of progression. First, then, after. The earth is your human spirit. That's where the word of God goes. It goes down into the real you, your human spirit. Praise God. Give it time. Hey, man, he said, like that farmer, you go to bed and get up and you go to bed and get up and you go to bed and get up. I always like to add praise God. Hallelujah. But when you go to bed and get up, you will come to the place in time that that production will happen. You may not even understand how, how in the world it happened, but it will be there. Praise God. Over time. Then verse 29. But when the fruit is brought forth, when the miracle happens, immediately he puts it in the sickle because harvest has come. That's the bottom line of the word. The harvest is 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold production. Praise God. Hallelujah.
So we walk by faith, the scripture said, not by sight. We walk by the word, not by our senses. We walk by the word, not by what the media says. Praise the Lord. When we walk with God, you have victory. Blessings.